Towards the end of the 1980s, the IBM compatible PC had finally evolved far enough to have games that didn't totally suck, and the race was on to bring out an audio card that could complement them. Many tried, and many failed, but the AdLib became something of a standard for a time. As with all things which are successful, copycats were never far behind. Let's have a quick look at a couple of AdLib clones from that time period. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason. I think you know the drill by now. We're going to look at these AdLib clones. Uh, that's really about it. I don't have much else to say on the intro of this one. Editing and everything's going to be really simplified on this, I would think. Uh, just black station trouble, so I'll go into that at the end. Things always break this time of year, it just seems to be the way things are. Hey, what's that sound? What's that That's the sound of 25 years of Sonic! No, not that one, please. This one. Now if you're not familiar with the AdLib, you probably think it sounds kind of shit. If you are familiar with the AdLib, as I imagine pretty much everyone here is, you probably know it sounds kind of shit, on the subject of which I swear this microphone quality gets worse every time I record with it. I really should try to fix that next year. Now, it isn't unlikely that there were other cards out there, the technology certainly existed to do it, which were far more capable and sounded vastly superior to the Yamaha Fartmaker synthesis of the Adlin. But, as usual, it all comes down to that same old hurdle. Cost. Yamaha's 3812 was relatively cheap. It was a two-chip solution, the turn generator and DAC. It ran at voltages readily available in a PC and so negated the need for any on-car power supply, and it could be interfaced with the IS Airbus quite readily using simple glue logic, which is worth absolute pittance to purchase in bulk. It might not sound that great, but it sounds better than the common alternative of the time. At least the Yamaha chips were actually designed, though if you've ever worked with them, to what extent is very open to debate, to play music, whereas the programmable interval timer on the computer's motherboard almost certainly wasn't. This could now be relegated to sound effects. Of course, what you can actually get out of the system speaker is a whole subject on its own. It can certainly be abused into doing things it wasn't supposed to, but for the most part this is largely impractical. Now, whilst it's not quite the same, the technology of the FM chip was also established in arcades by this point, albeit usually with more capable implementations inside those cabinets, as few of those cabinets would have to be made, and cost was less of an issue in a rented machine that had a coin input slot on the front. The AdLib card was a relatively affordable device, or as affordable as around $200 could be at the time, versus paying almost three times this for a MIDI controller card and an external module, a decision which, in hindsight, would be rather foolish if you weren't intent on becoming a composer yourself, as very few things would likely work with it otherwise. Unfortunately for AdLib, that same cost-cutting and simplicity would come back to bite them in the ass rather quickly. No sooner was the card picked up by developers such as Sierra did an army of companies you never even heard of reverse engineer the card and try to make their own version with varying degrees of success. And that's what we have here. One being a revised design dating back to the late 1980s and another from the early 1990s. Now you might be booing and hissing thinking that there's something underhand going on here, but this is absolutely not the case. AdLib did not make a single thing on their card, other than designing the PCB layout, and to be honest that layout is so simple that even someone who has never designed a PCB could probably sketch it out within a few minutes, and probably even find a way to improve on it. The components on the card range from 7 4 series glue logic, likely TI designs available from an uncountable number of suppliers already, and the Yamaha chips which, naturally, Yamaha were quite happy to sell to anyone willing to pay for them. It wasn't as if AdLib had exclusive rights to the design and its use, or even an exclusivity contract with Yamaha. 
Similarly, Adlib couldn't exactly dictate what any given user may or may not plug into their expansion slots, even if it just so happens to be a card which does the exact same thing as theirs. In a rather extreme example, if there was a lawsuit for every given time an electronic device used 7 4 series logic, there wouldn't be very many electronic devices out there. This, coupled with Adlib's refusal to drop their prices by more than about $5 to $10 a year, meant the clones took hold and the Adlib name faded away quickly from all but the setup menus in games. The user may have never even known they weren't using a genuine card and instead had a 100% compatible clone installed in their system. So what did these cards actually have to offer? Well, first up, it's the later one, a media technology branded card from the early 1990s. It's smaller and cleaner than the original, and even masks a port used by a certain later card for increased compatibility that may or may not actually be useful. It has a nice manual. It came with some tacky jukebox software, which is lost to history now because it came on floppies and, well, floppies don't actually work, so we're not going to be able to look at that. It doesn't matter, you don't need to install software. Applications can't really differentiate the card from the original. Functionally, it's exactly the same. Secondly, we have this other card from an unknown brand, but it appears the product name is Music Synthesizer 2. This particular one was also likely made in the early 1990s, but the design clearly dates back to the Adlib's infancy, if by nothing else shown by the haphazardly added silkscreen to denote it working in later machines than were initially available. This one is the more interesting of the two, really. It, it doesn't use a Yamaha FM chip, and instead, probably an attempt to cut costs even farther, uses a 5A12 chip from an unknown manufacturer. It looks cheap and clunky, it has a strange second output on the back, and the layout is a little messy. Once again, applications can't tell the difference between it and a real card, even without having a real Yamaha chip on board. In fact, from what little I've looked at that, even the pinout seems the same. That's probably a drop-in replacement right there, they're probably completely interchangeable. Now this one does have a feature which the real AdLib doesn't. These two headers which mention speakers. When designing a clone of anything there's always a chance to try and improve upon things, or at the very least introduce some gimmick as an incentive for people to buy it over the alternative. And sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't, but it, it always happens eventually, it's inevitable. Now it seems in this case it did work, at least on a functional level, because it added a useful feature. One header connects to the programmable interval timer output on the motherboard, it probably best referred to as a PC speaker header, the other connects to the PC speaker. With the original AdLib, you'd hear music through an external speaker plugged into the rear of the card, but sound effects using the PC speaker would still play from said internal case speaker, with no way to connect the two together. This may sound weird, but some early games consoles actually had the speaker inside the console rather than playing sound out of the television. Maybe it's just something people in the 80s were used to. Now, this music synthesizer clone gets rid of the disparate audio problem though, because both sources will play through the output jack on the rear of the card, or if nothing is plugged into either of those jacks, it'll play through the internal case speaker. It's certainly not the only card to do this, but it's a fairly early example of it, and it's a very primitive implementation, very, very to the point and bar burns, but more on that later. That's enough babbling. I suppose we should have a listen to how they actually sound, so... Well, first we'll listen to the genuine AdLib card. I don't own a genuine AdLib, I, I won't pay for one, they're overpriced, so these are recordings kindly provided by Nintendo. Needless to say, second and third, you have the Media Technology and Music Synthesizer 2 cards. There's certainly a difference between them, let's have another go.
I have to say, I'm impressed by the media technology one. The genuine ad lib seems to occupy the middle ground, and good god, that music synthesizer too is groaning. I'm not sure if it's that 5A12 clone chip, or it's DAC, or if the filter caps were just poorly selected. Probably just cheap components in general, but it sounds muffled, and for want of a better word, cheap. For some reason, I actually kind of like it. It makes me think of a, a low-quality portable TV or a radio that isn't tuned in quite right. It suits the 286 it lives in. Piece of shit. It, it really does. Everything about that is just grainy and of generally poor quality anyway. And let's be honest, that thing isn't a powerhouse of a machine. It's not really going to be that much of an issue. And overall, it's not like we have room to complain. On looks alone, it's pretty much the sort of sound you would expect to come out of a peripheral that looks like this. The noise floor is quite low though, surprising, and that's quite nice. By contrast though, the medium music one is crystal clear and it sounds as full and bright as the OPL2 can. Yeah, the Yamaha 3812 and by extension the 5A12 clone are OPL2 only, they're not OPL3 capable though. There's almost nothing ever used OPL3, it's not an issue you run into very often and, well let's be honest, by the time you really do run into that issue you're most likely going to be running a more powerful machine that wants a more capable sound card that actually plays sound and not just FM synthesis. I have to be honest though, this media technology clone does seem to have better audio quality than the original AdLib. Overall, it's quite interesting how different these two clones are, how they're both copying the same thing and yet take a substantially different approach to it. One of them clearly went for features and the other seems to have gone for quality. It's also notable that these were still selling into the 90s when much more capable cards were on the shelves, a mark of that same old demon rearing its head again, the cost of hardware at the time being rather prohibitive. Even by that time, sure you might not have the money to get PCM audio, but having FM music is better than having no music, and very few games would try to play music on the PC speaker anymore. That was fully relegated to sound effects by this point. Of course, too, the end the clone makers were outcloned in relatively short order by one particular device from Singapore. Having previously attempted their own music cards, which weren't ad-lib compatible and weren't very good, this time they instead opted to build a PCM capable card with an ad-lib on board. No doubt this task was eased somewhat by the ISA buses parallel nature. This card was rather cheaply made, it had a high noise floor and it used just enough non-standard hardware, namely a slightly modified Intel microcontroller, that copying it directly wasn't entirely viable for anyone else. This card would go on to become the next standard and would effectively put AdLib, who still weren't fans of dropping prices and possibly couldn't afford to as the clones had done so well by now, failing to really keep up with what was going on, out of business. Wow, that was a long mid-sentence tangent. The Sound Blaster first appeared in 1989, and by 1990 could be had for $250 if you shopped around. By a year later, this price was almost halved. Now you had AdLib, FM Music, and PCM on the same card, as well as a mic input that likely wasn't really used. Quickly, new versions appeared which supported the growing trend towards optical media with CD-ROM controllers, and offered stereo, later 16-bit stereo, integrated a game port, and generally reduced the function of three or four separate cards down into just one. Now if you know me, you'll know I hate Creative Labs, and I hate the things that they make, but there's no denying that they were right on track here, they were on point. They struck at the right time, with the right idea, and with developers picking it up, it really was good value compared to the massive disparate PCBs you'd have to configure and install previously. However, no microcontroller is going to stop the clone makers, and it wasn't long before the Sound Blaster itself was being copied and sold at a cheaper price point, again with clones and compatibles which varied in both quality and features. 
Some were very bare bones. Some tried to be flashy, and some completely ignored the idea and just attempted to do their own thing, without even trying to clone the Sound Blaster at all. The multimedia PC trend was taking off, and it would be the now fully featured sound cards like the Sound Blaster, and not the simplistic, primitive music cards of yesteryear, which would carry this forwards. There is a notable feature missing from the Sound Blaster though, or there was initially. It doesn't really have much in the way of inputs, and it didn't gain a PC speaker input until the Sound Blaster Pro 2 and Sound Blaster 16, somewhere around 1992 or 1993. To that end, there is something rather interesting about the PC speaker input on the older Music Synthesizer 2 AdLib clone, because AdLib cards have no mixer whatsoever, largely as they only have a single mono audio source. The clone doesn't have any real mixer either, not in that sense. So that input is mixed entirely through very simplistic analog means. There's no silicon or logic sitting in the middle, and the signal you get is exactly what comes out of the header on the motherboard, only with reduced power as it's been through a few resistors by then. You may remember some time ago, I talked about a later sound card. In fact, one which offered Sound Blaster and AdLib compatibility. The MediaVision Pro Audio Spectrum 16. At that time, I noted how it didn't use cables to achieve a PC speaker pass-through. That it was basically the opposite of this simple music card. and employed a more complicated means of sniffing the PC speaker signals from the ISA slot directly. If you're not familiar with the Pro Audio Spectrum 16, that speaker header is actually an output. You plug the speaker into that. The PC speaker pass-through comes from the motherboard itself. It doesn't need a cable for this. Now, we compared the Pro Audio Spectrum 16 to the Sound Blaster 16 and noted how it sounded different to most of the cards. Where most cards use an analog cable and mix the signal digitally like the Sound Blaster 16 and will sound the same as the Sound Blaster 16 echoing these out of the jack on the rear, the Pro Audio Spectrum 16 using no cable handling everything digitally sounds markedly different as far as its programmable interval timer pass-through goes. It certainly doesn't sound like the other cards do. So my assumption was that it might not be accurate despite most everything else, such as the FM chip's clock, being more accurate than Creative's cards. This AdLib clone serves to answer this question, because the signal undergoes no processing whatsoever, and that means whatever comes out of the back must be accurate to what comes out of the motherboard. Now we will know whether the Sound Blaster 16 or Pro Audio Spectrum 16 have the more accurate PC speaker pass through. Curiously, it seems that it was creative and all of the other designs, such as Yamaha and ESS and countless others, who got it wrong. And that MediaVision's implementation, despite being the odd one out, is actually the most accurate of the group. It sounds far closer to the pass-through on this AdLib clone than any of the others. And that's right, it would seem that what we've been hearing for all these years from all these different sound cards is actually wrong. Well, honestly, I don't really know what to think of this, but I do feel like we've been lied to. And once more, I realise how much I wish Media Vision was still around. Well, I think that about wraps that up. I do find it mildly interesting just how different these two clones are to one another, and how neither of them are quite the same as the original Adlin. I mean, really, there's nothing to have stopped them just outright copying it one-to-one. -one. Just change the shape of that trace there, you're probably get away with it. Which, 
is a thing worth noting. If you run older machines and you really, really want an ad-lib card for it, then, well, there's not really much point in paying for a, a genuine one. They're quite expensive a lot of the time, and that's why I don't earn one. Unless I happen to find one for free, I, I'm not, not really interested in having one. Because these clones do just as good a job, if not better, in the case of the Media Technologies one. I, it's, I am really impressed with the audio output quality on that. It's very good. Uh, as I say, find the genuine one, I think, is just a waste of money. You probably get a clone cheaper, especially as people are still making ad lib clones. And to that end, it is so simplistic, you might as well make your own clone. I mean, it's going to cost a bit more than buying someone else's clone. Because you'd have to get the board fabricated and get all the components. But it could be a fun little project. It's something I've tried to do. I had issues getting the boards fabricated. But just from pictures, because the ad lib's only a two layer board, if you get a picture of the front and back, the traces on it are so visible, you would easily be able to make up your own version of it in some software and just send the board off to be fabbed. And you'd have your own ad lib club. Now, workstation troubles. Yeah, uh, Seems I've been hit by a Haswell problem. Uh, I, it took me a while to get to the bottom of and it's all I can really think because it doesn't seem to matter what I do. My Xeon is mysteriously overheating and yeah, my heat sink's clean, pace's good, fans are good. Uh, motherboard's fan control has been weird. It was slowing the fan down. I disable, I always run everything full speed and as soon as Windows would start, it would turn the fan speed down. So I thought it was that, locked the PWM cable off, runs at full speed, but yeah, it uh, still happens. So far as I can find out from reading about other people's experiences, seems to happen on quad-core Haswells where the heat spreader breaks its bond with the die. I guess I could delid the CPU or replace it, but my hard drives go out of warranty next year, so I'm just going to hang on a couple of months. Look at replacing the workstation. Uh, not sure what I'm going to do hardware wise yet. It hasn't been a bad machine, it's done alright. I've never had much attachment to it, it really is just a tool this one. I said when I talked about the Pentium D that that was the last one that I really cared about. That was when computers just became tools, they got boring. And uh, Xeon is very much a tool so I won't really miss it that much. It, it has been good, it's done its job. but. On the other hand, that is Intel failing me again, which isn't good. Luckily, I'm not a fanboy, so if AMD can get me something better, I might go over that. And CPU-wise, AMDs do look better to me right now for what I'm trying to do. But unfortunately, much like in the K7 era, which was the last time I really had anything to do with AMD, other than Socket 939 being utter shit, uh, that's a whole story. Of so I don't think I'll ever talk about that on this channel, but socket 939 crap but I haven't been on AMD system since then unfortunately the motherboards still seem to suck and be quite limited on features all this segmentations which pushes me into having to use epic to do what I want to do and they're prohibitively expensive at which point I might as well just go over to Intel again <laughs> you know it's it's bullshit it's, I don't know what the fuck they're doing I, I really don't they've uh, they've shot themselves in the foot on that they really have because they just don't have an equivalent because of the boards and the chipsets and it's it's crap I'm not gonna lie and even then Intel's platforms have problems with PCIe lanes and shit it's quite restrictive to me it's problems with this one I'd rather get around uh, I really don't like where the technology's gone I haven't for years and it's it's just crap now it really is it's shit it's horrible to work with it's so restrictive and it's just riddled in ways where there's no reason these things shouldn't work but you have to give them more money if you want to do these things uh, it's it's an absolute garbage I, I fucking hate it it's, it's why I like old machines like 486's and shit because you just do anything you know if you can plug some in the board it's gonna work one way or another if you've got the patience but and I don't have the patience now even if it required fiddling I just I don't I'm old I don't have an interest in the machine. Like I said, it's just a tool. I want to plug everything in, have it work out the box, and never look at it again. And it, it just sucks. But we'll get to the bottom of it. Back on the ad lib clones, yeah. 
as you can see, as with anything, a lot of variety in the, in the quality of, of these clones. And I do really like that music synthesizer too, even though it sounds like kind of trashy. That does appeal to me, but obviously it's not the best quality. Uh, the media technologies one is pretty good quality. And yeah, you know, like I say, fuck buying a genuine ad lib. Sort of seems like a waste of money to me. I don't know what we'll do next. I uh, have ideas, I have things in the pipeline as usual. Probably don't want to do too much with this work station until I get a new one. So, yeah, it's uh, unfortunate, but it's the way things are. Uh, there's not really much I can do about it. And uh, honestly, I'm not in a hurry, you know. I hate to disappoint you, but I'm just not. I've got more important shit. i got things I'd rather be doing than fucking about with that. I'm going to look into it, but I'm not hurrying along. I mean, I'm not going to be in a hurry to spend probably four figures on something that's probably just going to break again in a couple of years, because it just seems to be where things are now. But anyway, I, yeah, I really have nothing else to say today. So, as usual, I'm High Treason. Thanks for watching, and remember, don't be a screw-up, Lord Dust 622It's kind of crap to think the 486 is like 30 years old now. I figured I'd just throw it. probably has been for a few months. It was like 1989 it came out. Ugh. It's not fun anymore. <laughs> Shit. The fucking Pensy will be there in a couple of years. And that's when it, I think it's going to hit. Because it still sounds modern to me. Like the word Pentium. It's like, ah, oh, Pentium. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm going to go and just sort of stand in a corner and try not to think about that, but whatever. <laughs>